I know that drugs haven't been a part of, of your coping mechanism, but what's a way that, that you have coped with the pressure or the anxiety or the racing thoughts that, man, you're like, man, I can't handle it this way anymore. Because for some people, it's food. For other people, it's drugs. You know, it doesn't seem like you overeat or, or do drugs. And you don't seem like much of a drinker. So what's the thing that, that you're like, man, the way that I coped with it la last year is not the way that I'm going to cope with it this year? It's interesting. You know, a few months ago, if you would have asked me this question, I would have said, I don't know. But I was on Lewis House's podcast mm. a few months ago. I love Lewis. And then I had Thomas DeLauer on. Also a good friend of mine, too. I love him. He was on my podcast last week. And both of them said something similar that has made me really think about a coping mechanism that I've used in my life. That is training yeah. and prepping for some sort of big event. Yeah, staying busy, right? Staying busy. And the first like big prep that I ever did was my Ironman prep in 2019. And I started it right after my mom passed away from cancer. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I came back from Pennsylvania after her funeral, and I dove right into that prep, which is a big distraction for... It's all-consuming. Uh, for everything I was feeling, right? Like I, I kind of like... I don't want to say I ignore the fact that my mom passed away from cancer, but I spent all my free time either working or training. So I had no time to think about it. Mm -hmm. And from that, that race in 2019, up until last weekend for my bodybuilding show, I, I've gone from prep to prep to prep. Yeah. Ironmans, ultras, 70.3s, marathons, bodybuilding preps. I mean, for the last four years, mm. I've gone nonstop from prep to prep to prep. And I think that's been my coping mechanism for yeah. just sanity. Yeah, I think discipline makes you feel freer, makes you feel secure. So if you have a plan to be disciplined in, that gives you some security. Well, I think that's why I honestly had an eating disorder when I was 14 years old is... Mm. This ability to control mm -hmm. and be disciplined with just something, mm -hmm. it so happened to be food, that gave me some sort of sense of just... Power and authority. Exactly. Over myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's unique how much our childhood really is so ingrained in us and can help us to create success and empire in one area. But if we don't really deal with the genesis or the, the trauma, like you said, now, you know, as you begin to unpack and figure these different things out, now you can say yes to the right things, right? And I think one of the ways that, that you're stepping into that is, is starting to share a little bit of your leadership and your legacy weight with other men. And that's like a new, a new thing for you too, because when you left the military, it was just you. You know, so you've been, like you said, lone wolfing it for quite a while. In the last like 10 minutes that we have, Nick, I would love to know your relationship. Like when did your relationship with God start? What was your upbringing? I'm hearing you, you grew up in Pennsylvania. So tell us a little bit more of that backstory. I mean, going to church growing up was, is, was something we did. I, I wouldn't say growing up, I had a, a relationship mm -hmm. with God, but we go on Sundays, it wasn't every Sunday. Mm -hmm. We were athletes growing up, so mm -hmm. we were going and playing sports. And if we missed church, it was okay. But if we were home in town, we were going to church. And we were always part of the church. But when I was in church, I was, I was sitting there zoned out thinking about something else. Mm. You know what I mean? I, I, I never, growing up through high school, even when I was in church, I wasn't listening right. to the pastor. Check the box, right? Yeah. That's how I was. Went to college, stopped going, didn't really think much of it graduated, joined the army when I was in ranger school, actually, that's when my relationship with God started getting reignited. Mm -hmm. Cause you needed to depend on something bigger than yourself. 100%. Yeah. Like so I'm, I'm, I'm getting beat down mm -hmm. for, I was there for four and a half months. And once a week we had the chaplain come in mm. and do a service. Do you remember his name? I don't remember his name. I remember what he looked like. I remember him playing guitar. I remember like we would be at these, these services. We'd be crying. Yeah. All these ranger school students crying and the way they got us just in, like crying out to God, right? Yeah. And yeah. singing the songs and the way they would get us in these services was, you know, you're getting starved in this school. 
So if you're you know, if, snacks in church, yeah, if you come to church, they give you, you walk in through the line, they give you a piece of bread and they put a scoop of peanut butter on it. Mm. So they get you into services. Services was 45 minutes and the ranger instructors couldn't touch you there. So you were safe. And yeah, it, it gave us this, this sense of purpose and, and something we could look and lean on mm. during these really difficult and hard times. Mm. And that's, I mean, that's when I started reading my Bible in my free time in ranger school and i really leaned into my faith there but as soon as ranger school was done it, it stopped yeah again it went away i didn't think about it that was like if i can interject that was like in the nfl they had we had chapel once a week during training camp and that's when people didn't know whether or not they were going to go to make the team bro chapel would be freaking packed during training camp as soon as final cuts were over nobody showed up yep. everybody needed jesus until <laughs> final cuts it sounds exactly like ranger school that's exactly how i mean oh, it that's funny. man we we want guy when we need it but when we don't need him we're like okay you could go away now and then so I, I graduated from that school 2014 uh spent the next couple of years in the army and then right when i left the military you know, I was building BPN, bootstrapping the business. Mm. Going to church was not on my mind. Right. And it wasn't till my mom got sick with cancer then that when she got sick, it's not even that I started praying. It's not even that I started going to church or like my faith got stronger. It was the last week we were with my mom when she was in hospice. Mm. So we, we knew she was pretty sick, but both my mom and dad kind of kept it from us how sick she was because mm. me and my brother were in Texas trying to build a business, you know, working nonstop. And it really was a phone call. My dad called, he said, hey, your, your mom's in the ICU. They're giving her seven days to live. You guys gotta get home right now. Dang. And for us, we were like, you know, we knew it was bad, but. That's a gut punch. Yeah, we didn't know. You, think, we, you think if you get a phone call, you got a few months, right? Exactly. Yeah. So seven days, so we, we rush home. She's in the ICU when we got there. And then it was probably two days after we got there, they pulled her out of the ICU, sent her home on hospice. Mm -hmm. So we get back to the house. Hospice gets her set up in my childhood home growing up. We all pretty much camped in the living room with my mom until she passed away in there. Mm -hmm. But the day before she passed away, because me and Steph were supposed to get married a few months later, and we didn't want her to miss the ceremony, so we did a small unofficial ceremony mm -hmm. with my pastor growing up in the living room with my mom there. So Dang. she could experience it. Wow. And when the ceremony was over, my mom said two things. She said, one, I'm going to miss you guys so much. And she also said, if you want to see me again, you have to believe in God. Mm. And I'll never forget where I was standing, where she was sitting, how she said that, what her face looked like when she said that. Wow. And Steph and I came home after she passed away and all the funeral uh, obligations were complete, found a church here in Texas and just started going Wow! and just started submerging herself in, in the church mm. and, and leaning into our faith, having conversations, mm. you know, before we got married, we never really talked about where faith was going to be in our relationship. Mm -hmm. The conversation never came up. Mm. It wasn't until after we got married that that conversation was a conversation. Wow. How, how is, how is faith going to be a part of our life? How, how do we want our kids to view Jesus in their relationship with God and where and how we go to church and, and what that's like in our, our home. Mm. 